Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to Tuesdays at 6 from the Cathedral of St John the Divine here in New York City. Today, the 13th of October, is the date of the, the premiere of my new transcription for the organ of Ray Fawn Williams' Fifth Symphony. And this concert is going to start in exactly 60 minutes' time on the Cathedral website, and it's very, very easy to buy your digital ticket, just go on the website and follow the, the instructions. It's just two or three clicks um, for just $10 you can listen to the whole concert and um, it'll be up on the site for 48 hours. So for this program starting right now at six o'clock, Tuesdays at six, we thought today it would be appropriate to have a little bit of an interview and a bit of an introduction to uh, the whole concept of organ transcriptions and particularly with um, the music of Rayform Williams. And it's my very great pleasure to introduce my friend, uh, the Director of Cathedral Music at St John the Divine, my very good friend and colleague, Kent Tritel, and uh, he'll be joining us in just a few minutes. To start with though, here is just a little taster to whet your appetite. The most incredible overture by Rayform Williams called The Wasps. I'm Kent Tridel, the music director here at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, and I'm happy to be talking with David Briggs, artist in residence. Hello over there, 12 feet away. Yes, we are. We're keeping our distance. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we're so close, I can never forget our work on Mahler II together. Mm -hmm. David, would you talk about your Mahler cycle? Yeah. Well, I've really loved Mahler symphonies since I was... Um, a teenager and I first got to know them as a viola player in the orchestra and uh, my first kind of baptism of fire with, was with Mahler 5 wow. in about 1979 in the Royal Albert Hall with Sir Charles Groves and um, things about Mahler's music once it gets into your veins it's very hard to, to shift so over the last gosh couple of decades I suppose I've transcribed as well as number five uh, number six number two, number three, number four, and number eight, and three of the uh, song cycles. So uh, I just love the music uh, and want to play it on my own instrument. Uh, that's really the main reason. Well, it's so fantastic, the transcriptions that you've done and the work we've done together on Mahler 2 and Mahler 8 has Absolutely. been just, you know, The first time was, light. I think, was it 2012 we combined using the wonderful Skinner organ uh, up in the great choir and uh, with a huge chorus and that's right it was the Manhattan School of Music Symphonic Chorus yeah and then we had the idea to do Mahler 8 we did which was unbelievable that was combined Manhattan School of Music choruses symphonic chorus chamber choir Oratorio Society of yeah. New York and the choristers from the cathedral yeah. and about eight soloists that's right I eight, think eight soloists yeah, and, yeah incredible incredible yeah. moment 
when we did that. Having done all of that with Mahler, what do you find to be the big difference between, or the similarities between Mahler and Vaughan Williams? Gosh. Well, I suppose, I mean, Vaughan Williams was, was later, and he didn't die until 1958. Mahler died uh, when the cathedral was opened in that year, 1911. Mm. And um, it's very intriguing to me that uh, although they're both, of course, quintessential r romantic composers, mm -hmm. they're very different. And actually, I learned the other day, uh, reading a very, very interesting uh, book about Vaughan Williams, that he hated Mahler. He really did not like Mahler's music at all. I think he found it too schizophrenic and too moody and too like out there on the you know on the sort of psychological mm -hmm. scale uh, which is not to say that there isn't some element some for instance in the fifth symphony of Vaughan Williams that it's some of it is very intense and uh, I mean the scherzo for instance is really I think incredibly sardonic and it's kind of dark humor but it, it's it's not quite on the scale of Mahler with that kind of intensity of of almost schizophrenic action. Uh, so, but I, I do think with Vaughan Williams, I mean, he was an interesting personality. He had this kind of image, this persona of being, he was six foot two, and he wore this, always wearing a suit, which didn't quite fit. <laughs> he was a little bit kind of haphazard, accident prone, um, a little bit what you call eccentric. Um, but he was clearly an absolute genius, Vaughan Williams. He knew everything uh, about Shakespeare, for instance. He was very, very literary, mm -hmm. and um, he, uh, he, he died, um, I, I think, in 1958. He was, he was reading um, uh, you know, an, a novel, like Jane Austen or something like that. Very, very cultured sort of person. Uh, and so, I, and of course, he was from, from Britain, and he's perhaps, along with Elgar, the quintessential sound of England. And mm. you really hear it, I think, in, of course, the Lark Ascending. I mean, mm -hmm. it just conjures up this kind of lush, green, right. rolling, uh, you know, having a pint, a nice warm pint, as opposed to the cold beer that we get in the US. A nice warm pint right. in, a, in a pint jug with a coal fire, uh, and the golden retriever lying in front of it and then you know he would click his fingers and the golden retriever would stand up turn through 180 degrees and sit down again and then RVW would light his pipe that kind of thing <laughs> exactly so you know it was very mm. uh, very it's a very um, mm. English existence and I think it's, it sounds very English this music this is not your first foray into a Von Williams project no tell us well I think it was probably five years ago that um, John Francis, my friend who's the secretary of the Vaughan Williams Society in London, uh, he invited me to record the complete organ works of RVW because Vaughan Williams was, I think, a very good organist, actually. Um, even though <laughs> he, uh, well, he took his FRCO in 1898, mm -hmm. but I heard on the grapevine there is some conjecture that he actually paid one of his mates to take it in his place because all the examiners are behind a, a big They're curtain. Screened, exactly. Uh, so who knows? We'll probably never know the answer to that. But uh, he was clearly a very good organist and uh, there's quite a bit of organ music. I mean, the truth of the matter is that it's a little bit variable. You know, some of it mm. is. I think he probably wrote before cornflakes at breakfast and maybe after <laughs> one or two whiskeys too many the night before. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But some of the best music is, is wonderful. And um, there's, there's an, an amazing piece called The Prelude and Fugue in C Minor, which uh, was dedicated to Henry Lee, who was kind of the Horowitz of the organ in England in the 1920s and 30s. And it's a really good piece. And nobody plays it because it's too difficult. Aha. Uh -huh. I bet RVW could not play it. Interesting. And interesting that he was so um, facile in the organ, and yet uh, we think that he was uh, not a person of faith necessarily. You know, I think he was a bit like Marla. He was always the big question mark. Um, mm -hmm. And it always intrigues me how somebody who is 
as you say, not necessarily a person of faith, although I think he he believed in a big bigger picture. Mm. But how somebody who who is not a practicing Christian can write the G minor mass? That I think is really an extraordinary thing. I agree. I mean, every time I do the G minor mass, I think to myself, how could it be possible that he that he might not have some kind of sense of of yeah. the great beyond. Yeah. And, and, and also, um, back on what we were talking about earlier, I'm always amazed at how he can conjure the antique, you know, the yeah. early music. He can con conjure the early and then have the greatest romantic strokes. Absolutely. That are just amazing. And he brought them right into mid-century. The interesting thing is that he was always asking other musicians for advice. He had a little bit of a you know, a, a low self-esteem, it seems. Interesting. Uh, he was always asking for advice on orchestration, people like Gordon Jacob and things like this. Uh, but Gordon Jacob apparently just sent it back and said, Rafe, it's perfect. You know, because, mm. I mean, clearly he had an amazing ear, an amazing gift for sonorities. I mean, you look at the, the huge variety of his orchestral output, the tuba concerto, that piece yes. for harmonica and orchestra for Larry Adler. I mean... Yes. Who, all that wonderful film music. Well, um, and you take the difference between the G Mass in G minor and the five mystical songs and Dona Nobis Pacha. Of course. Which, thank God we have that, because without that, I'm sure we would not have had Britain's War Wreck. Of course. Amazing. Actually, the C Symphony yes. is a piece that's very dear to my heart, because it's the last piece I ever conducted in Gloucester Cathedral. Oh, when I was director so. of music there, it was in the three choirs in 2001. Uh, what a fabulous piece with the Philharmonia and great soloists. And actually, Ursula Vaughan Williams came to the concert and we had wow. lunch. She was absolutely hilarious. Really? She's one of the funniest people I think I've ever met. I mean, once she started on a roll talking about her relationship with her husband, because they were married only for five years, but I mean, it was amazing. He, he just, you know, Vaughan Williams, he kept creating right to the end of his life right up till the Ninth Symphony. Some composers like uh, Sibelius, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who didn't write anything for the last 30 sure. years. Of his Rossini, life. I mean, right? Ex exactly. Uh, but RVW, it was a kind of late flourishing in all respects. And they traveled, oh, they amazing. came to this country, you know, he lectured at Princeton and Yale, he came to New York. Uh, and um, so, so that was great. But Ursula over lunch, absolutely hilarious a little bit hard of hearing and had definitely been on the sherry oh i see
But David, let's talk about the transcription process. You've done so much work in this arena, and you do it so beautifully. How does it get off of the orchestral score and into this by way of you? Okay. Well, I suppose the most important thing, I mean, the, the kind of sine qua non, is that you love the music. Otherwise, there's no point in doing it. Um, and in the history of organ music, if you think about it, it all started with Bach. Bach was really the first major composer to, to make transcriptions of both his own music uh, and also other composers, um, notably Vivaldi, of course. Yes. So, I mean, in the history of the organ in the last three or four centuries, uh, transcriptions have always been important, I think. Mm -hmm. And also in the Victorian period, I mean, organists used to make complete concerts of orchestral music, usually smaller scale, but I mean, people like W.T. Best and Edwin Le Maire, I mean, people just expected to hear transcriptions. Uh, and then in the middle of the 20th century, it went completely out of vogue when everybody became interested in things like Baroque fingering mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and very contemporary music, you know, Messiaen and, uh, and even, even more recent than that. But I think now the pendulum has come more into the middle. And I think as often in the arts and in life generally, often the middle course is the most healthy. So now that we've, we've had a lot of experience with uh, thinking about articulation and fingering and note values from, from all the research that's been done into historic practice. Mm -hmm. uh, but also now people, I think, are, are being more open-minded in terms of, of, of programming. But you're asking about the actual technique. I mean, I start from the orchestral score and I mean, I listened to the piece, of course, on the there's several fabulous recordings uh, of Form Williams V with the score. And then it's just page by page, measure by measure, bar by bar. You uh, work out what is absolutely essential and what can be left to illusion. Uh, because, I mean, clearly with two hands and two feet, it's impossible to play what an orchestra of 80 musicians mm -hmm. would do. Uh, so it's like a, I mean, the, the intention is not to make a caricature of the orchestra, because there seems no point of, in doing that. It's sort of taking the music back to its brass roots, back to its absolute core, and recasting it. Uh, and all the time you're imagining the looming figure of Ray Fawn Williams standing over your shoulder, thinking, well, what would he do if he was giving me a little bit of advice. So that's the, mm -hmm. the, the kind of idea. Uh, and then actually with this piece, there's a, a very interesting piano duet arrangement by, uh, I think, a pupil of Vaughan Williams, Michael Mulliner, and that's been recorded uh, for the Vaughan Williams Society. It's, it's very interesting, and it's got a lot of RVW's more markings on the, on the score of the, uh, uh, of the piano duet. So I used that and did some cross-referencing. Um, so you end up with the final article and then I brought it here and started this very long pro pro procedure of registration mm. working out the colour scheme and the great thing about putting uh, a transcription onto Sibelius onto music software is that it's a kind of evolving process so that I'll rehearse here for three or four hours on a Thursday evening and make notes and then on Friday morning go back and make changes to make it more ergonomic and mm -hmm. you know if it's too difficult it doesn't want to be ungainly or unplayable or anything like that mm -hmm. so it's it's sort of evolved i mean i started this transcription more or less at the time of the beginning of the pandemic in february and uh it's been a, a marvelous project uh you know to have something really creative to do as and I mean, to, I mean, I would just like to say also that having the privilege of coming in here twice a week for 10 hours, it's been a, an absolute lifeline for me. So thank you very much for enabling this. Well, the room is blessed to have the, have the rocks absorb this sound, you know. We really believe that the, the stone is alive here with the sound of music. That's an amazing thing. It's so great to have you here. You know, at, on, on the business of transcription, um, I have two questions. One, 
we were talking about Mahler and Von Williams and idiom. Do you find that certain composers simply lie under your fingers when you come to the keyboard more easily than others? Or once you're doing a major orchestral transcription, is it the same nut to crack? That's a very interesting point. I mean, as I think I hinted a couple of minutes ago, it's a kind of recasting. Yes. Um, and so, I mean, I suppose certain pieces do work better than others, but I think if you've got an imagination, mm. it's possible to recast more or less anything. Well, and I, to go a little more deeply into the, the question of transcription, just um, when, if you could just talk a little bit about when is an oboe an oboe, mm -hmm. and when is it not? You know, the, the idea to, on the one hand, and you referenced this, to replicate the orchestral sounds on occasion, mm -hmm. There, there must be times when you have to do that. A trumpet call in Mahler, for example. But exactly. There are times when the greater musical element is served by some other option. Things like the beginning of Mahler 5, you wouldn't want to play that on the flute, for instance. Exactly. It would not quite work. Um, but I mean, just because it says clarinet solo does not necessarily mean clarinet solo. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the two instruments that we have here, the, the, the Skinner, uh, yes. currently. Oh, we can't wait for it to come back. But currently, soon, soon cu currently soon. under restoration after yes. our fire. But also, I mean, this extraordinary digital organ uh, by Walker Technical Company, where a lot of the sounds of this were sampled on Skinner uh, replicas of orchestral sonorities. Mm -hmm. So here we have cor anglais, tuba, French horn, and you know, in the something like the Vaughan Williams, this is really an absolutely perfect scenario because you can make the I mean it's not exactly the same as the orchestra but it has as much sonic breadth in a way and as much variety mm -hmm. and color right which is a great thing about the king of instruments isn't it absolutely
So ladies and gentlemen, I do hope you've enjoyed this short pre-concert talk and uh, we look forward to welcoming you in just a few minutes to the concert. Just, um, it's not at all too late to, to order your ticket, um, just $10, go on to stjohndivine.org, that's St. John Divine, or one word, S-T-J-O-H-N, divine.org. And uh, on the home page, just click on the, I think it's a picture of me sitting at the organ of St. James Cathedral, Toronto. And then scroll down to where it says tickets, order one ticket, and you just put in your email and your credit card in the normal way. And um, I hope very much that you'll enjoy the concert. Thanks for joining us.